Good afternoon and welcome to the Board of Education's workshop on deep learning and innovation. I'm going to call us to order and let's start with the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice all. And we should take attendance very quickly. So can we start down by do we count you, John, too, or just oh. trustees? I'm the superintendent, John Malloy. Jesse Van Z, Board of Education, Area One. Susanna Ordway, Area 4. Laura Bratt, Area 3. Rachel Hurd, Area 5. Shelly Clark, Area 2. Okay, and then can we have a motion to accept our agenda? Motion to accept the agenda. Second. Thank you. Roll call vote, please. The motion was made by Board Member Clark and seconded by Board Member Ordway. Roll call vote. Board Member Van Zee? Aye. Board Member Ordway? Aye. Board Member Bratt? Aye. Board Member Hurd? Aye. Board Member Clark? Aye. The motion passes 5-0. Okay, and main event is the board workshop, and we're going to go right to Deb. Okay, Deborah Pettish. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much, Trustee Hurd, and uh, good afternoon, trustees and distinguished members of Cabinet. I am Debbie Pettish, the Executive Director of Curriculum and Instruction, and I'm so excited to be here this afternoon to share um, some information with you with regard to deep learning and innovation, of course, one of our strategic directions. And alongside me, I have Chris George, Director of Instructional Services. So again, we are both really, really excited to be here. Before I begin to really dig in to the work related to deep learning and innovation, I really want to, uh, number one, thank you for providing us this opportunity because we love to talk about this stuff at any opportunity we can get, so thank you. And I also really wanted to send huge kudos uh, to the curriculum and instruction team because sometimes uh, Dr. Malloy, Chris, uh, Christine, some other colleagues, we go out and we present at conferences and it's always so well received. And I'm just thinking about all the people on the ground, uh, especially my coordinators who work so hard in the trenches for lack of a better term to really do the work. And I just really wanted to highlight that they're so integral to everything that we are going to be talking about today. So our agenda, We'll be diving into deep learning, talking a little bit about the what and the why. Uh, even though we have talked about that in the past, we're going to kind of recalibrate a bit. And then we will be digging into how the liaisons, the support of the liaisons, and how they're helping us to implement deep learning across the district. And then I will turn it over to Chris, who will be focusing on grading and assessment. So diving into deep learning. I'm sure you are all familiar with our strategic direction on deep learning and innovation, which states that we will create learning environments that empower students to own their learning so they find purpose, meaning, and joy in their education and excel in post high school endeavors. And so just ask that you please note some of the things that kind of jump out at you with regard to this statement, what you what really resonates with you, and hopefully you will be hearing about them when we talk about our work as we go through this presentation. Our triangle should look very, very familiar. We, of course, at the foundation have stewardship of resources, shared leadership, and culture of responsiveness. Then we have equity and social emotional well being with deep learning at the top of that pyramid. And I think this pyramid is so important because we cannot engage students in deep learning experiences unless they are existing in equitable learning environments where they feel included, where they're able to take risks. We also cannot engage students in deep learning and innovation unless they have a strong foundation for their social emotional well being. So, if a student is anxious, if a student is depressed, if a student feels that they're not truly included in that learning environment, it's going to be nearly impossible to engage them in deep learning experiences. 
but the flip is also true. The more, and the research backs us up on this, the more that we can engage students in truly deep learning experiences where we are valuing their choice, their voice, we're truly listening to students, then that is going to then support their social emotional well-being and create more equitable learning environments. So I just always love every chance I get to kind of highlight the interplay between those three. And I was remiss at the beginning to, to say, uh, there are certain points along the way that we're going to stop and ask for questions and feedback. But if there's any other points, it, it won't throw us off at all. Feel free, please feel free to, to throw out any questions or comments that you have. So in our strategic plan, we have three strategic goals for deep learning and innovation. I will focus today on the first two. So creating a coherent system that is aligned to support instruction and develop and implement instructional models that will engage students in learning at deep levels. And then Chris, of course, will focus on the third, using authentic forms of assessments where students are really expected to meaningfully apply their essential knowledge and skills to new situations. This quote, when I read it during some research, really resonated with me. So Larry Rosenstock said, everything else has accelerated, but schools have not. So schools have become more disconnected. The walls between schools and the outside need to be more permeable. So the way that I read that, and one of the reasons why it really resonated with me was because I feel like that's what deep learning is all about. We need to better understand what's going on, not only in our colleges, our universities, but especially our workforce. And not the workforce of 10, 15, 20 years ago, right? The workforce of 15, 20, 30 years from now. And that that really needs to be permeate inside the walls of our classrooms if we are going to have the best chances of supporting our students in succeeding in those workplaces. And then this um, somewhat emphasizes what, what I just said. So there's three colors on this particular table and they've interviewed employers. This is from the Future of Job Survey from the World Economic Forum from uh, 2020. And they surveyed employers about which of these skills do you feel like are decreasing in terms of priority, are stabilizing, and which ones are increasing? I don't think it'll probably come as a surprise that things like critical thinking, analysis, problem solving, self-management, working with people, those are all the skills that employers are looking for more and more. And, uh, and those are the skills that we want to be emphasizing in our classrooms if we are really going to support our students in being successful. So understanding deep learning. I remember when we first embarked on this idea of strategic directions. And when we landed on social emotional well-being, equity and deep learning, I really reflected and social emotional well-being and equity were two things that we had been talking about in the district for a number of years. I felt like to a certain extent, people understood what they were. Deep learning was a new term for us though. So I felt like with regard to deep learning, we were a little bit behind in supporting uh, our community, our staff, our students, and really understanding what it is and what it is not. And so any chance, any opportunity I get to kind of highlight that, I, I, I dig right in. <clears throat> Excuse me. So first of all, deep learning is going beyond the mastery of existing content knowledge. So content knowledge is important. It's really a question of how we are applying that content knowledge, that content knowledge, excuse me, to new situations and to new scenarios. So it's not that it's not important, it absolutely is, but how are we applying it in new contexts? And then again, uh, per what I said a, a few minutes ago, it's really a way to prepare students for the world of work, what they're going to be experiencing, what employers will be expecting. 
In terms of what it is not, it is absolutely, absolutely not a de-emphasis on foundational knowledge and skills. Our students have to have those foundational understandings if they are to be successful and if they are to be able to engage in deep learning experiences. And one thing that we have done over the uh, last few years with the support of the board, so thank you so much, is really dug in with our K-2 reading curriculum processes, professional development, and really looked at how are we providing or supporting the teachers and providing the foundational knowledge and skills that kids need in grades K, one and two in order to be successful as they move up in grades and where they will be expected to better comprehend what they're reading in not only novels, but in their science textbook, in their history textbook. So we uh, last year piloted and this year we have fully adopted, as you all know, uh, phonics CKLA curriculum based in the science of reading that is uh, so far uh, based on both, both uh, quantitative and qualitative data showing really great results at supporting students in developing those foundational knowledge and skills. And some anecdotal, because I have a first grader at home who's experiencing it and it's been going amazingly well. I've just seen his reading abilities jump since the beginning of the year. It's been amazing to watch. Uh, deep learning is not a lowering of standards and expectations. And it, it really is the exact opposite. So we've always really expected students to acquire content knowledge. Now we are still expecting them to acquire that content knowledge, but then have the ability to apply it to new situations, to solve problems, to devise solutions to problems that devise solutions that we don't even know are out there yet to problems that currently exist. And the third one that I hear about at times is this idea that we are relying on only one teaching method. In order to do deep learning, you have to only have project-based activities in your classroom. And that's not true. We have an amazing teaching staff. They are professionals. They are trained in this area. And we support them in understanding when do you use lecture, right? When do you use small group work? When do you use whole group work? When do you allow students choice in voice? Because it's, you, you can't allow student choice in voice with every single thing that you do. So there's so many decisions that our teachers have to make and we trust them as professionals to make those decisions. And I don't want you to think that we are saying no lecture, all project. It's just, it's really just not that simple. So I think I'm going to stop there uh, before showing you a, a video series that we've created. Um, and ask, uh, number one, what's resonating with you so far and why? And what do you feel we might be missing in this conversation of the what and the why of deep learning? I think one of the things that's resonating with me, sorry, is um, this idea of educating, sorry, educating a, um, a student for the workforce 10, 15, 20 years from now, as opposed to educating them for the workforce that existed previously. Mm -hmm. um, and, and looking at what uh, um, a successful person needs 10 years from now, not what they need to get into college, not what they need to graduate, but what they need to be a successful um, working person contributing to the community. Um, 10 years from now, so that resonated with me. Thank you. What resonated with me was the critical thinking piece, mm -hmm. and I'm kind of experiencing this through my son and him entering the workforce mm -hmm. because his boss talked to him yesterday or the day before about he had, he had some experience before he went to work for this company, but basically what his boss told him was, I hired you based on the fact that you were going to be able to problem solve and and think on your own and and solve issues that came up or whatever and luckily for him he's he's doing that but that part of the job about 
being able to um, be somewhat independent and think on your own and come up with solutions to issues. He worked on an issue for them that um, about integrating a new software system and had some different ideas because one of the reasons why they they hired him was because they don't have a lot of young people in their workforce. And young people have lots more information a lot of times than people have been doing it for a long time. So that critical thinking piece and being an independent thinker, problem solver, standing on your own is so, so important to be able to teach. Thank you. For me, it's kind of related to those of what you said, that it's actually application, right, of the knowledge, mm -hmm. content, skills, um, because, um, and not only for work, but even before work, it's in classes and stuff. And I know we'll have a, a little bit of a discussion later um, about grading and assessment and stuff. But um, I think that um, it's just not, uh, application is really, really important because, you know, we don't want, um, you know, just to, uh, students to be able to just do, you know, apply in one way. And then, and, you know, uh, maybe a test question comes up or it, in work, right? The different situation come up and they only know how to apply it that way. Mm -hmm. So it allows adaptability and flexibility mm -hmm. of thinking as well as the problems. So that, that so, yeah. Thank you. I want to elaborate on what Susanna was saying because that adaptability part, I think, is is key and what's really resonating in what you presented is the both and piece of it. You, you can't do the real deep learning and the application and the critical thinking if you don't have the foundation and the application of what you've learned is is like the evolvement of integrating the skills. So now they're they're yours forever. It's not like studying for a test and then you forget it next week. It's it's now just part of what you know it's part of your memory and I think we are hearing all of us when we have these student panels on these visits when John asks them the question about tell us about a memorable experience when do you remember being really excited about your learning every single one of them is some kind of application related to, to core important stuff but that whole why am I learning it piece is is answered right there every day so all of it's resonating Dr. Miller often uses the term uh, learning that sticks. Mm -hmm. And I shouldn't put it on the slide, but maybe I should have, but that's kind of what I'm hearing. It's, you know, when I was developing this presentation, looking back to my 1980s history class, when the philosophy of education was quite different, and there was a lot of memorization of facts and generals and dates, and um, it didn't stick. I don't remember it now. And I probably didn't remember it at the after the test, right? But I don't think it goes as far as what we were talking about here 15 years ago about mm. you don't need any facts. You can always look them up because some of the facts are what create the branches for you to hang new stuff on. And so mm. it's it's that integration of, of all of it, but not just emphasizing the facts that in isolation don't mean anything. Right, I wonder if I would have remembered the facts, those would have stuck if I had to apply them to yeah. something. A or at least the deeper. key ones, right? You don't need yeah. <laughs> every date and every war, but you need to know the, the, the critical moments because then they come up in references as analogies to other things, right? But if you've never had any of that, you're like, oh, we'll get the analogy, right? So uh, thank you. And I, and I think one of the like, best examples I've seen so far on these school site visits of deep learning, yeah. when we were at Stone Valley and we got the Shark Tank presentation, and this was based on them learning something about history, which involved facts and, and dates and all these events that were happening in that period of time, but then marketing it like a Shark Tank presentation. Like they were going to, one group was going to supply medals for coins and swords and armor to us. And they wanted to be their metal supplier for the Byzantine area or something like, something like that. <laughs> and it was like, that's 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 deep learning and when i first started on this board i think my first conversation yes, with john yeah. was i was like what is this on the street deep learning means nothing you know like people don't get what deep learning means and so i think we've done a good job as a district also highlighting these on the friday 
writes or whatever yeah. that that newsletter is called yeah. and and showing what it means um you know, when i went to college it was we, our motto was learn by doing and it's this exact same thing as, as as deep learning but i think to piggyback on what rachel said it's both and and um and we're seeing that and and also th these things about jobs in the future with the um, genesis of AI and open AI and chat GPT, all these sort of versions that are coming out, what you can't replicate with that is human intuition and critical thinking that's based on these foundational knowledges. So I agree. If I can just add, Suzanne and I were to school today, and I think this is so telling. We have block scheduling in, in the majority of our schools, and that means a longer period to learn. And one of the students shared, I don't like block because it's too hard to sit and listen for 90 minutes. So we unpacked it a little bit. And I said, well, it's an intention isn't for you to sit and listen for 90 minutes. But if we really do, and we're working on this as a district, change the instruction so that there's a period of time when you're listening, there's a period of time when you're collaborating. There's a period of time when you're working independently with the support of your teacher present. That's what deep learning is. So it is true. We all can't. I'll speak for myself. I shouldn't speak for you. I have a hard time sitting still for 90 minutes in a passive state. So it's important for us to keep in mind that, as, as Rachel also said, every student who had a meaningful learning experience define deep learning as we're trying to implement it. And our job is to help our staff build upon all the great stuff that's happening. This is not reinventing the wheel. And our community to understand that yes, it may include technological things, but that's not necessary. It may include those things. But too often you talk about deep learning, people go right to technology when it's actually different when you talked about critical thinking, creativity, and so forth. So thanks for highlighting that. Thank you. You asked, and what do we? What else do you think could be inserted? Yeah. The, the piece when you're differentiating the not reliance on one teaching method, I, the one term I think I would add to the mix is where does explicit instruction fit in? Because mm -hmm. I think a lot of times it got a bad rap, but it, it has a role just how John was defining in in not just the basics, but in in all of it. And um, but it's not only that, because that would be just sit and get. And uh, but that whole idea of I do, we do, you do, and the the other tenet of lots of opportunities to practice. Thank you. All right, then uh, we will move on in the next slide. I believe it's a video. Okay, great. So let me go back one. I wanted to go back to something that Trustee Van Z said, um, and I don't want to uh, mischaracterize it, but when when you started, uh, when I started, and we started talking about deep learning, it, it did take me some time to really kind of wrap my head around what it meant really in reality. And so what we decided to do was develop a series of videos that are really like highlighting certain aspects of our work, including deep learning. So I want to show you a video, and this um, probably is, is not really meant for the board as much. We start off with some basics about the district. But with that being said, after the video, I would also love to um, learn more from all of you with regard to how do we go out to the community and get them to better understand what this is. Or do you think it's an issue when you're out and about? What is the community asking you about deep learning that maybe we need to do a better job of clarifying? So I'll just give you an example of this uh, video, some videos we're creating. The San Ramon Valley Unified School District is among the highest achieving districts in the state of California. With approximately 30,000 students, the district continually maintains graduation rates in excess of 96%, while approximately 95% of seniors plan to attend college upon graduation. In 2021, the district created a set of strategic directions that have provided a clear framework and systemic vision that guides all of the work that we do in SRV USD. We are dedicated to continuing our longstanding tradition of academic excellence by enhancing opportunities in order for all students to thrive and succeed in innovative and inclusive environments. An important component of our strategic directions 
is the idea that we must provide deep learning experiences for all of our students if they are to acquire the knowledge and skills needed for success in a workforce that is constantly changing. Deep learning is another aspect of innovation. What it means is to have your students think critically and dive deeper into a topic rather than broader. Essentially, it means that you're spending more quality time on solving problems rather than quantity and surface level. To engage in deep learning is to think critically, is to be creative, and to work collaboratively with your team or classmates. Schools must adapt to ensure that students are prepared to succeed in the 21st century. Whenever I think of deep learning, I think of a machine learning. There's supervised learning and there's unsupervised learning. And unsupervised learning, you uh, train a machine learning model with data without coercing it into a certain set of outcomes, which allows for uh, to get new ideas from it. So I think it's kind of the same thing for students. Um, if you have a very structured and focused view of what exactly you want students to learn, they're going, uh, they're not going to have the same new insights as they would if they have a more unsupervised approach. It was really nice for some of our teachers to have the freedom to try different things because the one thing we have seen is that students have come back totally different learners and getting them re-engaged in the work has been a challenge but I think once teachers kind of have that freedom to try something and if it works great if it didn't how can we go back and tweak it and try again has been amazing. I think one of the most influential teachers I've had so far was Mr. King for AP Lang. Um, he was very different uh, from the other classes I've had because he wasn't very lecture oriented. He was more of a open discussion type of teacher. Um, so it was nice to have something new. And I feel that I've gained a lot of new insight to not only novels and literature, but also the real world because I feel that um, both big projects and small projects can promote deep learning as long as it's meaningful. I think when students see that we as educators are not afraid to fail and try new things, then they are more willing to try new things and be innovative and take risks. That's one of the things that I think really connects with students when they see us as the adults, as learners, they become much more comfortable with the process themselves. So if we're learning alongside them, or if we're trying something outside of class, and we bring that experience to the classroom and share it with them, share that vulnerability, students connect with that, and they become more willing to try new things and take risks themselves. Deep learning and innovation have emerged as crucial components of modern education, enabling students to develop skills that are essential for success. We've shifted in the way that we're delivering our education. And I think there just needs to be a patience with our teachers, with our parents, and also with our students. But I, I'm just excited for the opportunity to have this kind of learning for our students now, because I really believe that we're preparing them for real life. The main points uh, for me is just mostly freedom and student agency, because I, if students have control over their own learning, they'll feel responsibility to uphold it. So before going on to the next slide, again, so we're in the process of developing this video series that allows individuals, whether it's our, our staff or our community, to really visualize uh, what we're talking about, right? Because I know a lot of times we use EduSpeak and the community doesn't necessarily know what we're referring to. So we're trying to create these videos, but do you have other ideas on how to engage the community to support them in better understanding? deep learning, what it is, and to what extent should that come from the district versus the schools on the ground supporting parents in their understanding? One, one just kind of immediate off the cuff thought that I have is that um, idea of experience. So maybe a school site can offer a opportunity for families to come and experience deep learning um, in a you know, a festival like setting or something, you know, so that 
as an adult, you can have that, that experience and then relate it to how, how you do, how you do your work, how you, you know, how you exist in life and see that this is connecting to that, that when I'm working on a project at work and it's collaborative and it's, um, and it's critical thinking and developing around data points and all those kinds of things. And it's sometimes with my hands and sometimes with my mind and, you know, and, and I'm, I'm leading and I'm following and all of those opportunities. And that's all in that deep learning with that, that student's experience too. So, so connecting those skills that they're learning with what I'm doing at work and having, being able to do that in a real time, real person kind of experience. Thank you. I think it might help to uh, maybe at an event or something to um, invite um, certain uh, community members who are in different industries. Because like our uh, <laughs> right the, the panel that uh, or orient yeah all the professionals and listening from them for what they um, you know are looking for mm -hmm. in their future employees and from them. Right, not from the district or whatever, but actual uh, employers uh, and what they're looking for. And I think families might tend to come and interact and do it more if it's hosted by school site, but I think the mm -hmm. district can support it by, you know, getting it started and, you know, help with the first few and then, then everyone will start to feel more comfortable about having them. But um, so. But, but definitely, I think folks are mostly going to engage at their site yeah, yeah, or you. maybe feeder area. Okay. So, and an idea, piggybacking on Laura's great idea too, is maybe the video series should actually be showing, here's what deep learning looks like in math and mm -hmm. showing an example of classroom instruction, application, things like that. And I think also, you know, 60 to 90 seconds of like, less words, clear and concise, uh, printed words on the screen to kind of highlight what's happening on there. I And I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not trying to like just completely deconstruct the, the no. video, but I'm thinking from a, like a consumer standpoint, um, because I can tell a lot of effort went into that video, but there were so many words and a lot of different concepts of what deep learning is that was kind of coming at me from one from a student perspective, others from teacher perspectives that I'm not sure if if I wasn't sitting on this board and so connected with what was going on, if I I'd understand what was happening on, on that video. So kind of honing in on one lesson rather than yeah. a lot of popcorn. Yeah, because there was a lot of pop, you know, like it was like machine. And then we did kind of, based on the, the presentation that you showed us before, it was like, it's not just, it's not just one or the other, it's both and. Um, but then in some of the statements, it was like, I, you know, I like this teacher because it was it was open discussion where you not lecture. So it almost contradicts that. And I could see community being led down a path of like, oh, they're doing this. Mm -hmm. And then there was a, a few statements, too, on that that seemed like we were testing things out and we were being willing to fail, which I think I understand where they were coming from. That could be perceived as we're testing this out in the classroom. We're not really sure how this is going to work, but I know what the intention was. The intention was we're not we're not worried to try new things, which is what the kids need to try in this application phase of deep, deep learning. But I'm just thinking from a like, wordsmithing point of view. Thank you. Yeah, and I would say to to Jesse's point in terms of communicating and making things digestible, mm -hmm. and I think you know having this this type of great comprehensive video and then having the comms team pull out, you know, some 30 second reels about, you know, and some specific sound bites that then become digestible and provide multiple opportunities for the multiple audiences, the students, the parents, the, the community members, staff to be able to, to interact with it in different ways, if that makes sense. And I know that Alana kind of probably knows what I'm talking about. No, that doesn't make sense. Thank you. Well, just want to add to that. I think that also by pulling like examples of what deep learning looks like for math or for reading or something that that actually goes through um, all levels, TK through yeah. twelve, right? And because I know that it seems like you know it's more for that um, a high school, you know, or no secondary, but it's really elementary. And and if I can just add, one of the things I'm learning from all of our visits 
is that our students need to be supported to be learners, not grade getters alone. It's coming at us in every meeting. Now, we want our kids to get good grades. I want to be very clear about that. But I'm hearing more about the grade and less about the learning. And so we really also, I think, need to think about our culture and what it is we're trying to do and why and incorporate that everywhere we go. So when I say we want our kids to be great learners, we need to illustrate that because there is a paradigm in most of the conversations about tests, exams, note-taking, memorization, grades. That isn't going to be solely what our kids need. Yes, they need to be able to take tests. Absolutely, they need to score well. And I keep using the both and language. But if they can't sit with difficult concepts and figure out how to understand all aspects of a problem and figure out how to navigate all the emotions that might be part of that, and come to terms with what they think and why, and then be able to communicate that in a way that actually is respectful, but strong. That is a massively significant skill. And our kids were telling us at a recent visit, we need to practice more talking to each other so that we can get better at it. I mean, again, I wish I could just videotape every student panel. Maybe we, maybe there's an idea, but uh, because, they say it so clearly. I, a student today said, we need to be taught how to have difficult conversations with each other about how we're different. In a room of 20 kids, I did not exaggerate that. We need to be taught how to have conversations that are uncomfortable. And, and I just sat there and said, he's right. That's deep learning. And you can see the evidence of the coaching they've had in conversations through the years. Because when you listen to them, and I'd like to add on to that or to elaborate, they, they use those transitions because those have been a really strong part of, of our, our ongoing curriculum, right? But then take it to the next step about how do you also disagree or add nuance or, you know. One of the things I was thinking about, because again, I'm having this experience with my son being in the workforce, was when we're trying to communicate with students about these, um, the, the competencies and student panels and the power of that has students talk to students. Having um, some of our students who are alumni who are in the workforce working in different parts, of, different industries and different parts of of different professions and what they're experiencing with the kinds of um, competencies that they need to have in the real world that they're actually do living and doing and how those connect to what we're we're um, we're talking about here as far as deep learning i i think they would have a lot to contribute and i think that they would maybe be more effective in some ways um, more powerful in some ways than some of the things that we might say. Yeah, and I and I I'm just in my mind, I'm thinking about op open houses at the end of the school year and using that as an opportunity as well to have some, whether it's in the specific classroom or it's in the NPR, having, you know, some show and tell around deep learning or something around deep learning that we can, you know, we have the eyes and ears of families at that that night and be able to to interact what the students have done all year with deep learning and showcase that at open house. Thank you. Great. Thank you all so much. Super, super helpful information. So thank you. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the six C's. We've spoken about them before, but just to highlight them again. And so these six global competencies are what we we're trying to build into our students, right? They're the skills that the employers are looking for. I go back to Dr. Malloy's um, example of communication, right? And how can we really communicate effectively, but also communicate with one another and take that what we've been doing to the next level. So how do I deal 
uh, with my friend when there's a disagreement about a particular topic, right? So of course we see collaboration uh, and you think about um, all of our, our jobs, the activities that we're a part in, uh, of, a part in uh, our family communication, uh, it takes these six skills in my mind to be successful. Collaboration, working interdependently as part of a team, critical thinking, information's coming at us all the time, TikTok, like with my seven-year-old, TikTok, YouTube, you know, whether it's it's the, the, the news, I mean, it's all the time, it's relentless. How are we evaluating that information for its validity? Communication, uh, we talked about, but also communicating, you know, I, I can have brilliant ideas, but if I can't communicate them either verbally or in the written form, not gonna mean much. So then we have uh, the remainder of the six C's. Uh, of course, creativity, going back to that idea of problem solving and being able to come up with novel ideas. Citizenship, it's starting to sound like a cliche. We're so connected globally. Imagine what that's going to be like in five years, 10 years, 15 years, how easy it is going to be to interact with others from around the globe in our, in our, in our work world, in our personal world. So that idea of citizenship and really giving our students that global perspective. And then character. And I think the one that really resonates with staff is that second bullet point. Like how in our students are we really fostering their grit, their tenacity, their perseverance, resilience. So if they're not successful the first time, that's okay. How can I work through that, get through that obstacle, that wall and get to the other side? And we hear that a lot from staff that, that students don't have that like they used to. And it's just so important. So what you see here is if, if we're trying to foster the six C's in our students, we're trying to use these four elements with our teachers to support them in designing deep learning experiences for students. So we have learning partnerships, learning environments, leveraging digital and pedagogical practices. So again, these are the four things that we're really, really trying to support our, our teachers in doing in order to create these deep learning experiences. One of them is a focus on pedagogical practices. So teacher as activator, right? Teacher, as we sometimes hear it, facilitator, uh, as opposed um, to that sage on the stage that we've been hearing about. Inquiry, problem solving, providing students choice and voice, what they're learning, how they're learning it. Again, not any choice, but certain choices that students could be making, for example, on how they wanna communicate what they know about a particular topic to the teacher for a given assessment. Learning environments, we know our students have to feel safe and included, but also have to feel that level of, um, that risk taking is okay. And then just this idea of space flexibility. So with deep learning, there might be time for lecture. So you need to, to be able to have a room that fosters that. But then students also need to go off and work in small groups. They need to be able to have active areas. We talk about maker spaces, right? We have to have all these different options available for our students in their learning environment in order to really foster deep learning. Learning partnerships. And to me, there's kind of two aspects of this, and this one kind of gets twisted a little bit. A lot of what we read about deep learning talks about learning partnerships with outside organizations. So how are we partnering with the town council to do something in our community? How are we partnering with maybe a conservation organization to come up with some ideas on how to save the birds, right? Okay, you pick, pick your poison. But, and that is a piece of this. But at the same time, it's also about the, the, the relationship between the teacher and the student and how that is changing. And that the teacher isn't the holder of all knowledge, but they're really working side by side with the student in co-creating and co-designing as much as possible. There are some parameters there, of course, uh, what's going on in the classroom. And then the last one is so important, um, Trustee Benzi, I believe you brought up uh, chat GPT and all the AI we've been um, hearing about and reading about. And that definitely impacts how we're using our uh, digital tools. And so instead of using it for really kind of accessing low level information, 
how are we using it to really propel our thinking and uh, assess what we're doing? I'm hoping you're able to see this, but it's essentially, of course, we're wanting to go up on that continuum so that we're not only using technology for information consumption. That is a piece of it, and that is important. But hopefully at certain times um, during the day or the, the week or the school year, we're moving up that ladder and really using technology to create knowledge. So yes, we're researching basic facts, but then again, applying those facts, using those facts to create your multimedia presentations, using technology to truly collaborate with peers on learning. So that's a piece of the lever leveraging digital. So how are we implementing this across? What, are, what, what tools are we using and what approaches are we taking to implement deep learning across our 35 sites? So the first is to uh, build capacity, provide foundational understandings for all staff, partner with global leaders, since this is somewhat new to us, or, or at least was two years ago, provide instructional coaching, and then the use of deep learning as really a driver for all of our work. So let me explore those uh, a bit more. We, when we first started out, we said we could take one of two approaches. We could teach all of our, I think about 1,700 certificated staff members the same thing, okay? And that's important. But we knew we needed to build leadership capacity in this area more than our other two strategic directions particularly because we had been talking about social, emotional well-being and equity. And we had people who were leaders in those areas in the district. We didn't necessarily have them for deep learning. So over the last two years, uh, we have a deep learning cohort sites over uh, elementary, middle, and high. And we provide them with in-depth professional development with one of our partner organizations so that they're really building capacity at their site for people who understand learning at deep levels and can eventually, I say eventually, some are already there, really lead the work across the sites and others can look to them for that leadership because it cannot just be the district office. It has to have teachers who are wanting to do this work and who are leading this work. And they also, in addition to the in-depth pro professional development, they also have an opportunity to access some deep learning curriculum. So it's uh, through a company called Define Learning. And these are really high quality sets of activities and units that support teachers in uh, implementing deep learning. And they're kind of ready to go, but they can also modify them according to the needs of the classroom. So I know at Montevideo, for example, uh, they, the kids were tasked with creating a candy store. So think about all the different uh, work that had to go into the what candy, how are you choosing what candies in that candy store? Why are you choosing that? How much are you going to charge? Why are you charging that? And then eventually you talk about learning partnerships. They had um, an owner of a local candy store come in to kind of talk about their process for doing that. So just another example, and the de defined learning curriculum really supported us in doing that. And then I think it's really important to celebrate our successes as much as possible. And I would like to thank the comms team because I think they've done a really great job of doing that, especially in our um, Friday Brights, because we're doing so much great work and we wanna hold that up at the district and show other teachers that this is happening in our district now. So yes, this is something that you can do as opposed to showing the work that's going on around the world, right? So really celebrating their successes. And then we also just recently did a three-day pretty intense uh, professional development with uh, an organization called New Pedagogies. And they came in and trained all of our liaisons for three days and we're essentially the trainer of trainer models. So these individuals will be able to go on in the future and do work with our cohort sites or other sites and really digging deep in this work. So that's our first prong. Our second prong is we did also feel in addition to developing leadership capacity, we needed to also develop some foundational understandings for teachers across the district and other staff members. 
So uh, my wonderful team developed this idea of shared leadership teams. There's not much time in the calendar where we have everybody, okay? Individual sites have collaboration time, they have meeting time, but it's difficult for us to kind of get everybody. So they actually devised an entirely new model that we implemented this year, and it's called shared leadership teams. So we get, um, there's six throughout the year, and we get the principals, the assistant principals, the liaisons, and any other teacher leaders, counselors, uh, teacher leaders in a particular area that we're focused on on that day, whoever it may be to come to these meetings. My team creates professional development on a particular topic. Uh, most of the topics have integrated deep learning and our equity work because they are very much integrated. And we do, we engage those teams in professional development. And then we provide them with time to think a little bit more deeply about how they're gonna take what we did and modify it for their staff. Uh, because, you know, what Alamo Elementary needs is maybe different than what Doherty Valley High School needs, right? And so how are you going to take what we just taught you, modify it for staff, given what your unique are, your new, excuse me, unique needs are at that particular site? And so that's been really great because on one hand, we're developing this deep leadership capacity. And on the other hand, we're really providing foundational understandings for all. I mentioned the partnerships with um, literally global leaders in this work, New Pedagogies for Deep Learning is providing us with a lot of the professional development. Uh, again, we use them to uh, do the trainer of trainer models with our liaisons. And then we have Defined Learning providing really high quality curriculum for our cohort sites. Instructional coaching, I'm going to talk more about the liaisons in a minute. But of course, we have our liaisons going in and supporting individual teachers, groups of teachers, uh, course alike teachers, grade level teachers in supporting their use of deep learning strategies. And all of the research really points to the importance of instructional coaches and the impact they make on sites. And then this one is, is, we really just use it as a driver. We talk about it all the time. And I hope you, that you're seeing, I, I at least hear that you're um, hearing on your site visits, how deep learning is really integrated into what they're doing, what they're saying, how they talk about their approaches to instruction. And so I hope you're hearing that because we at the district office use it as a driver and a lens for everything we do. Um, including, and I just put one example up there, our curriculum adoption. So before we even decide what we are going to pilot for particular curricula, we have a very extensive rubric that is based in deep learning. It also has an equity component. And so we won't even pilot anything that it is not strong on the deep learning scale. And that's just an example. Hopefully model at meetings. And so they're more engaging and we're not, it's not just that sit and get lecture. It's going to model as much as possible. And then I really want to thank uh, Azine Devusade, and you saw her on that video. Uh, she has been running uh, with the support of some members of my team innovation forums. We're, we're getting together um, some teachers. Right now, we're starting with the high school teachers who are just doing some like really innovative work. It's almost like a think tank and getting them together. Last year, we're doing another one in a few weeks to talk about how we can grow this work. How are we assessing progress? Um, so we are doing classroom walkthroughs to collect some baseline data on what we're seeing with regard to the use of the deep learning strategies. What are we seeing? What are we not seeing? Because we need to know if our multi-pronged approach is working. Are those SLT teams, professional development, is it making a difference? We also have our standardized tests. We have California Healthy Kids, where we're looking at meaningful participation, participation, excuse me, in student choice and voice, because those numbers should go up as the deep learning experiences go up. Um, CASP, ELA, and math, uh, they actually have, to me, some fairly rigorous questions, performance tasks that they ask on those assessments that should be, that really reflect at points in time, our deep learning experiences. And then the development of a learner profile. 
and I know some of you are on that and are meeting this evening, um, it's essentially going to be our guiding light. And it's going to incorporate those six global competencies in some ways, might change them a little bit, but they're all going to be in that learner profile. And it's essentially a summary of the cognitive, personal, interpersonal competencies we want students to have. So right now we have the six global, we're working through a process with we have students and community members, administrators, where we're going to say, are these six global competencies enough? Do we need to add? Do we need to change? Do we need to augment? And here's just an example of what some of them look like. You could imagine us using them uh, K-12. So it's not just about high school students. You can see the one on the left. This is something that we would use with kindergartners, first graders. Um, to support, uh, really to support the teacher in understanding what am I really trying to achieve here with these kids. Role of the liaisons. Well, I, I'm sorry, let me stop there. So I shared a lot of information with you about our approach to implementing deep learning. Do you have other ideas or things you're hearing maybe on your visits that you would like to share on things that we could be doing better? I know it was shared by one of the principals who's one of the cohort at one of the cohort schools that there's kind of what Jesse was getting at. There's all this mystery around what's the term deep learning mean. And then once they've been diving into it, they're like, oh, I do that. Right. So it's kind of taking some of the mystique out of it, but not just going, oh, I already do that. Right. And I think, I think by the nature of the elementary day, it's kind of lends itself more to it already because they have the same kids all day. It's it's when you get up into secondary where there's standards I got to get through and got to get these kids from this point to this point for the next course where it gets harder to integrate all the application and, and those kind of things. Mm -hmm. um, but at least this elementary school principal was saying, just kind of showing them what it is was a big step in, in just it kind of getting rid of obstacle number one because, oh, I can do that. I can learn more, but it's not as scary. Thank you. Can you tell tell us, and maybe maybe you can't, and that's okay. Um, where we are as a district in this process with the deep learning in relationship to our teachers and their ability to execute this. Well, so we are collect we are currently doing instructional walkthroughs. So we provided some professional development and are now doing walkthroughs during the month of March to collect that baseline data for our uh, district dashboard to really better understand where we are. Now, my gut is telling me that there are pockets that, that our our philosophy of building leadership capacity is working because there's really these pockets of individuals or groups that are doing it extremely well, and we need to continue to build them up while bringing the others along. But we are actually collecting quantitative data on that. Do you see more uh, of it being done in elementary versus high school versus middle school? I mean, just, uh, I know we don't have uh, all the data yet, but it, is, it, is there a trend? So if I can jump in first, because I've just been going to the high schools recently, and we've been having this conversation, and it connects to what Rachel said. And we have to work through this. So yes, I would say our high schools would be having more difficulty generally than our elementary schools. And part of that is because of the notion that Rachel stated that there's this deeply held belief that I have to get through this much content or my students will not be successful. And what we're going to do in light of those discussions is there is actually a significant body of research that has emerged recently, where when students are guided through the essential standards of a course, and they actually take ownership for some of the going deeper with the teacher's support. In other words, the teacher does that direct instruction, creates the parameters, supports the conditions and allows the student to go deeper, even on AP exams, the results are 
pretty surprising if you believe that content driven teacher directed is the only way to go because that doesn't allow all learners to actually retain and understand because many learners not just a small um, many learners don't just learn from listening so we have to work through a very valid concern that if we make this shift our students have to still be successful the good news is Anytime there's a change adoption, we always have those who are willing to try things first. And we're already starting to see data on how kids are doing on assessments when we're providing these opportunities. So long story short, um, I'm not critical because I come from high school. I understand how we were trained to teach and how we were expected to cover content and how we were to prepare students for any type of final evaluation. And we want our kids to do well on all those things. And we have to work through the concern that changing practice will somehow change results. And that's where we're at right now. That's just my take from listening, but I'm gonna turn it back over to you and Chris, because I think you both have a significant experience on this as well. Um, no, I, I agree 100%. I think that elementary just kind of lends itself for a number of different reasons to teachers being able to do this. And there's just some, some barriers um, that aren't insurmountable whatsoever. But I think that we need to provide some different supports to our secondary uh, staff, particularly at the high school, in order to grow this work. And I think the more we in the more we encourage our staff and the more we I think there are we have so many creative teachers and so many teachers who come up with amazing lessons but there's there's always a fear with change that if this doesn't go perfectly am I gonna am I gonna get kickback from my kids from my parents from my principal and I think we have to make sure that we know that teachers have that feeling that we can take a risk and we can innovate and without fear of Sometimes lessons don't go as planned, but sometimes the lesson I do every year doesn't go as planned. So I remember being, I was at a workshop on deep learning and somebody, one of the speakers just said, does every member of your teaching workforce know that they have a green light to innovate? And that hit me and that has stuck with me for over a year now, because I thought the more we remove that fear of it's okay to take risks and try this and push forward, you know, you're not going to break education if a lesson doesn't go right that the more I thought we'd see that innovation because our teachers are awesome and they have the ideas and they're so good at, with creative lesson plans. But if we, you know, when we put that, when we ham it back or when our, when our just educational culture hands that back, then we lose that, we lose a ton of innovation. That way. You're totally reminding me, Shelly, I'm sorry, you've been trying to go. You, the discussion here is reminding me so clearly of a situation with my middle one when he took calculus in, in high school. And they waited, uh, excellent teacher, you know, great year, but the application project was saved till after the test. And I remember my son going, oh my God, I get it now. It was like all the stuff with integrals and differentials and, and, and how that translates to regular things in terms of building something and making something. And it was just, I wish we'd been doing stuff like this all along because it wouldn't have been so hard. And so I think that circles back to our beginning discussion about how when you're actually doing it and applying it, it sticks better than when you're just hoping to memorize it all. Go ahead, Shelley. I think the point that Dr. Malloy made about being able to have the data and show that our students are doing well under these conditions, the things that we're changing, because as many of you, I've been in the district for a long time. My, year, my kids are 12 years apart and I've seen a lot of changes. And one of the things that, that I experienced and came up against in the, at the high school level was the culture around grades and the attachment that parents have to them and what they mean for their kids and it's like this chain that leads to you won't be successful unless you have certain grades and so no matter what you have to get them and so I think being able to have that information to show that our kids are 
doing as well or better and they're learning more and more deeply um, is going to be a really important piece for us to be able to change the culture that we're in because it's really <laughs> it's really hard to do that so i i'm i'm hoping that we can make an effective change there yeah and i think as we're having these conversations we're talking a lot about staff and we're talking a lot about parents and and supporting them in this transition to deeper learning and just also keeping an eye on on the student experience and how we're supporting them in this their transition because they're the the ones that are experiencing it through deep learning um you know what one of the things that that stuck out at me when you talked about the idea of how staff really would love to see more development in grit and resilience and those types of things, and which is wonderful. And we all we all want that for our kids, and we we see the value of that in ourselves. Um, but but how are we ensuring that that a student can develop that, that they have the confidence to make that mistake? And you know, in the um, historically in the way that they learned. You know, especially when we look at our secondary students that that are transitioning to more deeper learning and and having the experience of one classroom being vastly different from another classroom and one teacher teaching a section in a different way than than there's their friends teacher and all of those things and that's just part of the transition and I understand that but um, but how are we ensuring that the student is not feeling a disconnect with the way that they're that they're being taught because it's different from what they they know. So and and giving and and that ties into I think social emotional well, um, wellness and and supporting them in that way. So and I'm not going to steal Chris's thunder because I think you're going to get into this but I'll simply say that part of what we're also changing is learning demands feedback. If every feedback, every piece of feedback is graded and then is averaged into a final grade, it changes the learning process. And I do believe in responsibility, accountability, and kids reaching the standard and exceeding the standard. The however is, if we want kids to truly investigate and practice, fail, listen, learn, and so forth, we've got to shift how we actually approach the accountability part. Again, both and. We want to be accountable and we want kids to learn. And I think Chris is going to talk a little bit about that because that's why deep learning and our grading work are intimately connected. Because I've used this example everywhere I go, and I apologize, you may have heard it. As someone who's learning something new right now, tennis, if I was graded on every move that I've been given descriptive feedback on, I would be failing. I'm not failing and I'm motivated to do better, but I haven't done really well at the beginning because I needed descriptive feedback to learn. I understand tennis is different than math, but it's similar in this way. If we're going to help kids learn that it's okay to ask questions, to not get it right the first time, to actually have to really think about the feedback to do better, we can't put a number and then average every single step and then call that rigor and then wonder why kids stress is growing and then we get into very challenging issues with grade challenges i want a 92 as opposed to an 88 and we have those dynamics because of this very specific commitment we've made historically to grade many things now i've just said the traditional I'm out and about in schools like you are with me. This is shifting all over the place. So I do not want any of our educators who are listening to this to think that we are starting at square one. We're not. However, we need to do a better job, and Chris is going to get into this, in engaging our families, because this is different than how most of us went to school. And that's why we would suggest that the real education and the real time commitment right now may need to be with our families so that we don't have misunderstanding that actually causes challenge with this movement forward. So I really appreciate your question because you are absolutely saying why these things are intric intricately connected. All right, so I am between um, this and Chris going. So I am going to go a little bit quickly uh, with the role of the liaisons, although I just have to give them so much credit. So I hope they don't feel like that I am shortchanging them. 
Um, our liaison work over the last two, year, two years has been absolutely amazing. Um, as you know, for the 23-24 school year and beyond, we are combining our multi-tier systems of support or MTSS and equity liaisons. We will have a total of 28, two at each high school, one at each middle school, um, 0.5 at each elementary, and then one at Venture. And I put this up there just because we refer to it so often, and I know it's probably unfamiliar to some in our community, but we tier one is essentially what teachers do day in and day out in the classroom, okay? It's just the core curriculum, the core instruction. So we expect that 80% of students will succeed when they receive really high quality tier one instruction. We know about 20% won't. Well. About 15% will need additional intervention. And that's um, of course uh, called tier two. And that's typically, you know, oftentimes during our common learning time, maybe during our BASI before and after school interventions, where they are in really small groups getting specialized instruction to learn the essential standards. Still, we know some of them won't be getting that. Then we go into tier three, where, where they have still time in small groups. It's just more intensive and it's probably over a longer period of time. So I just mentioned that so much. I just wanted to bring it up. We, we, we mentioned MTSS and tiered levels of instruction and intervention. And so I wanted to mention that. And then the work of the liaisons um, as they're combined, again, they are uh, still will be responsible along with, of course, the administrators in creating safe and inclusive learning environments. They do all staff PD and all of our strategic directions. They support those tiered interventions. So they collect data, they support grade level teams or course alikes in, in understanding what that data means for their instruction and how to change maybe tier one or create more effective tier two, instructional coaching, um, identifying instructional practices that may lead to disproportionate outcomes for our um, underserved students, and then provide support for, for common learning time, um, which of course is embedded into the day for all of our sites. And that's where you can do some of those, especially those tier two interventions in small groups. I have a tier two video, if it's okay, I think I'm going to skip over that and um, turn the time over to Chris since we have a lot more to discuss. Let me see here. Could you forward it to us though so we can watch it, send um, it to our inboxes? Yeah, absolutely. And then just one more slide, our next steps, we're continuing to build the leadership capacity through the court system and also develop stronger foundational understandings through our shared leadership team model, learner profile we talked about. Uh, we are continuing to do walkthroughs and really wanna expand on what those walkthroughs are and, and not just use them to collect baseline pre post data, but to really support our principals in learning from those activities. I'm continuing our partnership with those uh, leading organizations and celebrating successes in a variety of ways, including our video series. So I'm going to turn it over to Chris, and then I would love to hear your feedback also on the deep learning um, next steps, but I know we're running short on time. Okay, just, well, could just sure. make a... a, a so one of the things that when when you're talking about assessment of our deep learning, you know, and I know CAPS plays a, a, at least a quarter of a part, right? 25% of a part in that. And um, and I'm I would love to see some um some looking beyond having more than just four sources of the data. I know that as a parent, I hate to admit it, but my kids have asked me to not have to do caps, you know, and, and, um, and it's, and I know that it's something that a lot, especially in the secondary level that a lot of students, am I really loud? Oh. No, I was wondering what you meant by caps, but you meant yeah. caps. Caps, I'm sorry. Yes, I'm sorry. Sorry. I was just interpreting. Talking and not, not thinking. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. Sorry, sorry. But, um, but I just, I worry that that's not really um, 
truly accurate data, um, especially at the secondary level. And if we're putting all of our eggs in that basket, not all of our eggs, but 25% of our eggs in that basket, that we're not really getting a full picture. And so maybe there's ways to, um, to, look, to look at like how we can assess other ways to assess, assess deep learning to add into that assessment. Um, I don't know what that looks like, but just kind of keep I, that in mind. I agree 100%. The assessments we have right now don't necessarily match what we're trying to do. And so we need to develop better, more authentic forms of assessment. And so one example of that is if we're trying to build collaboration in our students, we have a lot of uh, resources that tell us what that progression could look like from grade one. What are you trying to build in there, build in students in grade one in terms of collaboration up to grade 12. And so how can we build those progressions and, and, and create assessments where we're better understanding how students are doing in those areas individually, but then overall as a district, which will also give us a better indication. And so that is something that we definitely need to do. And again, I, that will come kind of more in Kristen's presentation, but I agree with you 100%. Trustee Brett, thank you. Okay, we will get started then. All right, thank you so much for having us, uh, trustees. It's an honor to come here and we are so excited to be here to talk about the evolution of grading and assessment in our district. Um, this is a long time coming. Grading and assessment evolution is certainly not new. In many cases, it's been evolving for 20, 30 years. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about where we've been and where we're going today. Um, but we're just really excited to to be here, and I represent the work of an absolutely amazing teaching staff um, all the way across the board, especially those who have been working on the grading and assessment reform with us in the last few years. So um, to talk about grading is tough. It's a it's kind of a third rail subject when we get into it because it's personal for teachers. It can be really stressful for kids. I mean, it's the method by which they're judged, right? Um, and for parents, it's so very important because we equate grades to a child's future. Um, so to do this, we, as the Grading Reform Committee, came up with this statement about four years. And every year we revisit it to make sure it still says what we wanted to say. But this was our commitment statement. And this was the statement we said that was going to be central to our work. And as deep warnings come on, I really believe that this statement still sticks. But assessment in our district is a tool to provide consistent, meaningful, and accurate feedback. And it reflects pro that reflects progress towards mastery of specific and required standards to inform students, parents, and teachers about student learning. There's so many important phrases in there. I just want you to hold on to meaningful and accurate feedback. I want you to hold on to mastery of specific and required standards and inform students, parents, and teachers. Because assessment and grading is a conversation. This is how we talk to kids about their learning. So it's really important for us to continually examine how is it that we are that we are saying to our kids, this is what you're learning and this is what you have yet to do. Because that's the only way we're going to make sure that every last kid in our district gets to the standards that we want them to get to. So um, again, I said that just uh, talking about grading is a tough one because it's so embedded in our culture. We all got graded. We all got, a you know, we, most of us with the very few, very few exemptions got a grade point average and know what it was like to not get enough points to get the A and maybe get grounded from the PlayStation for the weekend. Um, and we all, we all had this experience around grading and to get into college and we all know how competitive it is now. But changing our grading practices doesn't mean that what we did before was wrong. It's just an evolution like everything else, right? It's just, it just certain grading practices might not be perfect for today's context. They were right then. The same way that if I were to take you 15 years back and we were to go into a classroom and see kids sitting in a rows, reading a book and maybe answering questions after reading a passage, we would have all said, man, that classroom was engaged. And now if we went in and said, is that an engaged, is that the kind of learning engagement we want? None of us would say that. We changed the definition. Education evolves. Grading practices are no different. And we've got to evolve with them. So. A little bit of our history of how we got here. Again, grading practices, certain grading practices and 
progression around grain prices has been going on for long before this timeline starts. But for us, I think it started in 2013 when uh, Mike Matos, who's a nationwide RTI expert, came and talked to us. And while he talked to us about RTI structures and kind of that's where tutorials and access came from, a lot of that work, it really struck us that we, we had to take the systemic responsibility for all students that it was on us to make sure that we were creating learner structures and curriculum and grading systems that made sure that it was our responsibility to get every kid to high standards. And that that was a, a sea change in our culture, right? Since then, we've seen the organic growth of assessment changes by staff. I think everybody who's had a, a child in a secondary schools in our district has had some teacher who was working with grading a little differently, whether they called it standards-based or evidence-based. Almost every student has encountered this in some way in our secondary staff. And by the way, and I should have said this at the beginning, largely the work I'm talking about is about secondary, is about middle and high school. So I'm sorry for omitting that. Um, in 2019, we started the Grading Reform Committee. And at the time, it was about 60, 60 people strong. It was uh, students and parents and staff members and, you know, district admin and we had counselors. Uh, as committees go, the pandemic wiped those out along with everything else. And we, we lost a little bit of membership, but we still remain about 30 to 40 strong on a good day. Um, during the pandemic, though, we saw a lot of opportunity to continue talking about grading because there was so much uncertainty that we realized that we had to keep talking about it. If you remember when the pandemic first came on, the biggest controversy we had was how we were going to grade kids. And we talked about pass fails and traditional grading. And that was really, we had some opportunities to really start this discussion. So during the pandemic, we, um, when we were all learning, wow, we can learn stuff remotely. We brought uh, one of the a nationwide leader, Rick Wormley, who um, delivered six hours of professional development for all of our secondary staff remotely in March of 2021. And he was really a kind of a great speaker about mindsets and about how we think about grading. Um, and that was just a great start. Last year, 2022, we saw the advent of our strategic direction, and we're going to talk about how, how important grading is to that in just a minute. Um, and then just this month ago, I think we, we had just a fantastic PD day for all secondary staff, where we were able to take the whole PD day and talk about assessment and grading. And we're largely today going to talk about what that PD day was and what the changes we're expecting from that are. Um, but it, we, you know, Dr. Pattis talked about different change models, about trainer of trainers. And this was a change model of what if we all took one giant step together as a district? What would happen? And that's what we tried on the 21st. And, and that was put together, and it was a completely teacher created PD day and had some great, great pieces to it. And I'm going to show you some today. And that leads us to today, where I get to talk to you about it. So we're back to our triangle, our strategic direction. Um, don't need to go too deep into it, except to know that obviously grading has an academic component, and we're going to draw the line between deep learning and grading and assessment reform today. But there's also a huge equity and social emotional well-being component to grading. And I want to talk about that because it's really important, because grading has a huge equity and equity lens, but not in the way that I think most people think. And we have to bust a few myths right from the word go on this. Grading is a driver of systemic inequity, and we'll kind of get into some examples later. However, when we talk about reforming our grading practices with an eye on equity, we have to be super clear that it doesn't mean we're giving everybody an A and that's equitable and fair. In fact, it's just the opposite. It's removing the inequitable pieces of a traditional grading system so that, so that grading does require and ensures and, takes and helps us take responsibility that every last student in our district reaches those standards. Okay. And that gets back to that systemic responsibility for grading that we talked about earlier. But it's a, it's a really important myth that there is an equity component to grading, but it's not about just handing out success for to feel good about ourselves or for fairness's sake. So I get a lot of my grading and assessment uh, information on social media. So for as much as we decry it, I get probably the best assessment research I get done is, is on social media. And this is a, a, fo a follow on Twitter that I do. And he's a teacher out of Washington who does awesome work on grading and assessment. But he kind of makes this link that when it comes to equity, 
averaging scores over time, and Dr. Moy referred to that earlier, that practice earlier, to determine a final grade ensures that a student who starts with skill gaps will never achieve the success of a student who doesn't. Can we just pause and think for a minute about what that message sends to our students? And there's a huge truth in that, and I don't, I don't need to pull it apart. But there is a huge truth to sending a message to our kids that it doesn't matter how hard you work or how hard you end up. The message we're going to send is that every one of your failures that you started with counts against you. We've got to work on that mindset. It doesn't mean we're throwing out anything tonight or tomorrow, but we've got to work on that mindset. Secondly, the piece around social emotional well-being, right? Just as important as the equity piece, just as important as the deep wording piece, right? When we talk to kids about grades, We've talked about social emotional stress for years. I remember conversations where we would talk about what if we could get every every parent in our district to take away their phone at eight o'clock. That, that didn't work out real hot, but we tried. And we saw, talked about what if we got more sleep. But when we talked to our kids, they were giving us one clear message. What stresses us out is grades. And, and Mr. A went from Twitter said this, schools will do wellness committees and talk about the biggest negative impact on your wellness in schools. And students will tell us, Grades, it's all grades. And we'll say, so I'm hearing we should bring back ice cream sandwiches at lunch. And we fail to hit the big one in the middle. Just this week, I was at Doherty Valley um, talking to kids about grades. And it's it's so glaring when we talk to them about, about the stress that grades cause. But here's the thing that we have to remember with our students. Learning doesn't stress kids out. Nobody stresses out about learning things. Remember when you were a little kid and you learned things, you didn't stress out about going in the backyard or learning something in a deep learning fashion. The stress comes when we start judging it and grading it and telling you you're going to get punished for it if you don't do it right. We can do this better from a social emotional front and we have to. It's, it's, it's so entwined with all, the, with all of our strategic directions that we can't do all of what we want to do without untangling this grade piece. So. So, and I've explained a lot, but I am going to, this is a video that was put together by our awesome teacher team who created the February 21st PD day. Um, and this is just a video. I may cut it off just for time about halfway through, but we'll see. Um, that talks about the role that grades in student lives. I think my grades would say that I don't cry as much in school and I really don't put in that much effort when I really do. Sometimes I just can't really get a grasp of concept or I can't fully really understand it. So it does kind of make it hard for me when I'm trying to live up to my parents' expectations. Um, I'd say my grades this semester have definitely improved, but my, uh, like, uh, since I'm a little like funny and like, bouncy in class, they aren't as good as I could proceed. I guess, like, in somewhat way, say how, like, academically smart you are, but in my opinion, they're more just, like, how hardworking you are. I think grades are more so of a reflection of how much effort you're willing to put towards the class, because grades tend to be higher the more effort you're putting into a class. So if you're more interested in one class, that grade is going to be higher than, say, a class you're not so much interested in. I think my grades say they represent how smart I am relative to everybody else. Um, as a person, I feel like sometimes, like, if I'm being honest, I don't think grades defined as who you are because you could be failing other classes like English and math, but that's just like book smart. People can be also like street smart knowing like they could read books and there's so much intelligent in other different ways. So I don't think grades really define who you are as like an actual person. I think the grades change the way I see myself and boost my confidence when my grades are well. And I think other people can see me um, the, the differently depending on how my grades are. 
I feel like my grades really don't reflect me overall as a person. I'm the type of person that am, is not a good test taker. And so although the rest of my grades are good, the test taking grades do not reflect me um, as a student overall and how I learn. Um, I feel it's like a 50 50 like it definitely does help because it shows me like if I'm trying really hard or not, um, but it can also hurt because I could be trying and totally not get what the teacher wants and it shows and affects my GPA. So do they stress you out? It really does. <laughs> Grades definitely stress me out because uh, I feel like uh, everybody at the school, since it's such, such a competitive school and everybody's in the, the highest classes and everybody wants to do this and that in high school, it makes grades seem like they're way important, way more important than they actually are. And sometimes everybody's like, everybody, a lot of people at the school are always getting you can see them getting hundreds on tests, getting perfect scores. And when you don't get a perfect score, it it brings you down a lot. I feel like because everybody at the school wants to wants to do the best. And I feel like that's why grades stress me out because it get, brings the standard to a much higher level. And when you're not at that standard, you can just you feel a little sad and you feel a little stressed that you can't you're not as good as you can be sometimes. Yes, yeah, they do. How come? Um, so there's like there's certain aspects of like my parents and then like the teacher part or the, how the teacher perceives you and also like your like social life. Like when your friends like ask you like, oh my god, my grade's so bad, like what's your grade in this class? And like it's kinda like I mean if your grade's bad, you're gonna be nervous. And like most of the time my grade's not that good. I think more so than anything, grades are like a cause of stress and it can affect like when when you're studying for something, I might be like, Oh, I have to do good on this test. And then that might put a little bit more stress on me. It might make it a little bit harder because there's more on my mind about it. But overall, I think it has like a slight effect on how your process of learning is. If you have other thoughts with M stresses in your mind. Uh, grades stress me out because I want to have like a good perception of myself and how I'm doing in school. And I want to keep track of my knowledge by seeing how my grades are and how well I do on tests and stuff to make sure I'm like, keeping track of everything and doing well in school. Yes, a okay. lot. Because uh, I get some pressure from my parents and that puts pressure on myself and I just get stressed when I'm like behind on grades. Uh, yeah, if I have a worse grade in the class, I feel like they would try to explain things to me more, pull me aside for access and pull me into accesses and things or pull me aside. If I do have a good grade, they'll probably. That we wanted to discuss. Um, so I just kind of wanted to ask you what you see and what you hear when you're out in our community, when you're talking to people and what you see from the video, what do you see about the role of about the role of grades in kids' lives, concerns and successes and hopes and fears and all and all of it, because we we're all talking about grades all the time when when we get down to it. So, and I just wanted to you know open it up for your perceptions of grades in our district, but your percep you know questions you may have that kind of thing. So for three years at San Ramon High School, I was part of the Challenge Success team. And Challenge Success is an organization I know everyone here is probably familiar with that challenges our students' vision of their success. And part of that was the stress around grades. So what I observed personally in working one-on-one -on -one and in groups of students, that the stress levels at that time, and I don't think it's really changed very much, were increasing exponentially around grades and competitiveness and in and, and it's coming from all areas not just you know not just teachers it's coming from parents it's coming from peers as some of these kids talked about students talked about in the video so it's 
a systemic problem in the secondary and it profoundly affects the way these kids function and how they feel about themselves and it was kind of heartbreaking to see that and to try to make the changes that we were trying to make at the time the timing was off i'm just really really happy that we're now taking this to another level and really addressing this in a deep way so that maybe we can create something different and have have our students have a different experience. So uh, I'm finding that uh, with my work, I'm actually doing some uh, social emotional work with my students who are um, receiving now some of the decisions from politics, right, in university. And very much so, you know, grades are very important in terms of the thoughts from the students, their perception in parents and peers. And the, the, um, the irony is what I'm seeing and, and my colleagues are seeing, and this is colleagues from high school and independent, all the different people who are supporting students going to college, high school students, that the grades, the higher grade, uh, students with high grades are getting bad news just as much as, you know, the others. So while grade, grades are very important in students' minds and families, uh, and they're being pushed, like Shelly was saying, pushed by themselves. Sometimes it's not even parents themselves and their peers, right? right? Uh, what they're trying to get at, it, it, it's not what they think. So that's why most, most colleges um, from the, you know, Ivy, the highest level to our, uh, you know, state school uh, and not just California, but all over, most of them are doing what's holistic review. That means grades are only one piece of many different things. So if we're focusing just on grades, you know, that's 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 not it, right? It's not gonna work for school. So I am I'm very, very glad that we're looking at grade grading, assessments, and how maybe we can help uh, our students and families. Well, and I, I think that that the a big part of the challenge is that it's 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 more than just students putting pressure on themselves, parents putting pressure on their kids, you know, teachers putting pressure on the class, whatever. It's it's actually in the very fabric of our culture, and so it's you know, so are are we going to be able to solve this problem within our district? even though externally it still exists. And um, I mean, I just, I don't know, I, you know, just this morning, it's the end of the quarter is tomorrow. And I brought school, I don't look at school. I've learned only to look at Schoology at around you know, maybe three, four times a semester. Like I'm just, I'm forcing myself to not open it up, but quarter's ending. I got to make sure the zeros are and I'm sitting with my son and I'm going over each class and he just, his demeanor, his frustration, his sadness, and starting that day with me grilling him on, be sure and check with your teacher. Can you get this in? Can you get this in? You're at a T plus. I shouldn't say that out loud, but you know, you can, if you turn this in, you can, you know, these kinds of things. And this is something that I can't help. I can say that honestly. I just, I, I see a sophomore who doesn't have an A average, and I worry about if they're going to be able to get into college. And, and that's ridiculous. I know that. But yet it's what I it's 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 so hard to explain. And I'm being truly honest and I maybe I shouldn't be, but I am. And I, I feel like that's where a lot of parents sit is that you once you get into that high school. And I think for some it's even earlier, you start to to think about the future of your child. And it's all based on their it really, truly feels like it's based on 
their GPA. And if they have a bad semester or they have a bad year, you know, and it's like, okay, I think, well, my, my one son had, I'm getting into personal stuff. My one son had a concussion, missed a bunch of school spring or fall semester is grade point average, you know, went down because of it. So I tell him, well, you can't change that, but you can prove that that wasn't who you are. So let's really work this semester to show who you are so that those college <laughs> admissions people can see that, yes, this semester was not indicative of how they are as a student. But it's not the semester, it's the grade. This grade was not indicative of how their grades are. And it's, and, but yet yeah, I'm putting that on how they are as a student. In fact, it's really about what the grade is. And that's that cultural fabric, right? So I say all that to say that this is super hard and I can't wrap my mind, or my mind around it and I'm trying to, and I don't know the answer, but I just wanted to tell that little story. I guess. One of the things that we are using as a model all the time is looking at the data, understanding what story it tells and being really upfront about that story. So to your point, we can't actually dive deeply into the cultural fabric until we actually look at data. For example, one of the data sets we are now auditing is there's a belief that you will not get into certain colleges and universities unless the following conditions are true. We want to figure out if that's actually true. If every single student from the San Ramon Valley Unified School District got into Berkeley with only that data set, then we have to be honest about that. But what happens if the data set tells us that actually this wide variety of students got into, I'm just using one school because that comes up a lot when I'm out and about. It's not the only school, obviously. We are trying right now to determine which are the data sets that will allow us to get at this cultural reality honestly and candidly. So this is going to be, we're calling this actually the next five years of work. Okay, this is not something that's going to be finished by September but it's something that we are embracing as a cabinet team and we're embracing it with our staff because what's coming up at our meetings, some of you have been there with me, is that there's all kinds of beliefs about this very issue, deeply held emotional beliefs. What's true? What's not true? And we've gotta be honest about that and then figure out what that means. And then how do we use other data to show how successful kids have been in this district who don't have that profile. And maybe they didn't go to one of the, I'll call them culturally held top 10 places, but they're doing brilliantly. So, so it's taking real data, not skewing it, not spinning it in any way, determining what story it tells, and figuring out then how to engage students, staff, community, parents, caregivers in what that means. It's kind of the 30,000, 10,000 foot approach, but we'll have more to say about what you're talking about in the months to come because we're, we're really pushing this because you are absolutely right. When something is in the fabric of our culture and it's not just San Ramon culture, it then makes it that much more difficult to get at because it's almost out of reach because there's so many views about this. So I apologize if that sounds esoteric, it doesn't mean to be. It's just that we're taking um, clear strategies about what cultural transformation looks like. There's a whole body of evidence about what that means. And we're utilizing that kind of map to plot out the next body of work. So it's gonna be complicated. And I think part of it too is challenging some of the assumptions of what you described, Laura, because so much of what you described in terms of that battle and that struggle within yourself was related to grading being really about compliance and that we grade everything. And I don't want to steal the rest of Chris's presentation, right. but I was the board member that was on the grading committee from when it started until just recently. And I feel like that was a real benefit to have learned so much of it. So I think the, the data John talked about is perfect, but it's also deconstructing just the paradigm of it, because if it wasn't 
20 or 30 or 40 or 50 or more assignments that he was having to get in while he was dealing with a concussion. And it was about authentic assessment about learning and not these points and these points and these points and those extra points and all that. Exactly. It changes it all. So I don't want to talk exactly. anymore. I want to get it. <laughs> no, and just to throw my two cents in there too. And so far, this presentation seems very 30,000 foot level where it's identifying the problem and some potential pathways to solutions, but not specifically, here's how grading reform looks like, here's how it's sure. changing. And it, it doesn't sound like that's exactly 100% where we're ending up on this presentation, but I'll, I'll let you continue on. But it seems also like when we're talking to the kids at the school, there is one of the the things that's been illuminating is it's not just what I would think is the teacher and parent pressure. The social pressure has been one thing yeah. that they've talked about oh. immensely and how how that just creates this this culture um, at school where they're I think that the kids are stressing each other out. And I know that that comes from external influences as well too. But then I think the interesting thing is we talked about you know raising resiliency and grit. And then we have, you know, we're going to have stresses in life as well, too. So, the, you know, this is one thing that I, I, I struggle with is stresses exist. How do we teach them also at the same time as we're doing this grading reform, how to deal with that? And actually, we as adults, we, we experience uh, the same thing uh, in sales. We say, hey, you're not your commission check. Right. Like we I remember being in sales, like you are not your commission check or else you're going to feel like a hero or a zero sometimes. And, you know, you're not the car you drive. You're not your paycheck. And but we we understand what it's like to actually have these external pressures as adults, too. And we we do play those out, too. Right. That's almost perfect segue because we are going to descend a little bit from 30,000 feet and get to what does this look like going forward? We'll bring the plane down. Um but there's, there's huge things in all of what you said and the pressure on kids. And we saw in that video, the one the part of the video that I didn't even remember was there was the kid talking about the need to be perfect. Like, it's not even okay to get the A minus. It's got to be perfect. And we heard that at one of our site visits this week. And it was astounding at how kids could be so disappointed in a 96. And I thought, if I worked out any of my high school classes with a 96, oh, man. Um but I think we've got to talk about it. And it's a, and I think, Laura, you pointed out that this is all a double-edged sword and it's all tough to work through because we've got to do this without lowering our standards. None of this is about saying, don't worry about being successful. It's not that important. That's not what we're doing. We're saying, we're saying that What's important, what will get, what will truly get you into college and keep you there, which is another data set we have to look at, by the way, is learning gets you to, learning gets you to college. Learning the standards makes you successful. Deep learning makes you successful. Artificially getting to a grade calculation does not. How many of you have had a kid who figured out the night before the exam I only have to get a 13% on tomorrow's exam and I keep my A. There's something very wrong with the way we're calculating that learning and that equation. And that's what we're attacking. But we've got to, every five minutes in this discussion, we've got to stop and say, remember, we've got, we're doing, we're not lowering standards. We're not demanding anything but success, but it's what kind of success are we demanding and how are we talking about it with our kids? So through all that, I want to get to, and I know, Got a little bit of a time issue, but I'll do my best with it. Um, certain beliefs about grading emerge. The first part, when we talk about why why is this part of our strategic direction? Why is this even important to us when it comes to deep learning? Certain tenets of grading have kind of emerged over time, and we codified them as a grading reform committee, and we shared them with we shared them with staff at the PD day. But really, it comes to this: that the purpose of grading assessment is to foster student learning, not to judge it; it's to help it along. It's to give kids a clear picture of where they are, what they've learned, what they have yet to do in order to learn. The purpose of it is to accurately, there's that word again, accurately measure and document pro proficiency and progress towards a standard. Report academic progress separately from work habits, efforts, and behaviors. Kids don't always learn the way we wish they would, but that doesn't mean that they don't learn. And there's that piece about students with disabilities. And there's that piece about where students come from or the culture from which they come from. We can't hold behaviors and work habits up. We can't hold that against their own learning, 
right? We absolutely want kids to learn responsibility, work at work habits. Absolutely. But sometimes we make having being a responsible person a prerequisite to learning math. And that's that's not right. And that's what that one's about. We want it to contribute to healthy social, emotional well-being and equitable outcomes. We've kind of already discussed that. We want the grading system to be part of that deep learning system that promotes curiosity, risk-taking, and sustain a love of learning. Um, somebody, I think it was Shelly, but I could be wrong, said earlier that our kids don't have the confidence to make a mistake because our grading system tells them not to and holds it against them for the rest of the quarter when they do. That's the kind of thing that we can stop. Assessment and grading, it needs to be, and this is a part we're going to talk about, about what we rolled out to staff. It works best when it's collaboratively designed learning targets. And we've actually done that over the past two years by creating district-wide essential standards, by collectively saying amongst our teachers, this is what it means to be successful in algebra one or sixth grade science or third grade math. It's only when we have that agreement about what success looks like that we can be better at, at um, assessment. And then talking about it down the road, we're going to be getting teachers together to align rubrics, to align assessments, so that it does lead to more consistency and better evaluations of student learning. So anytime we talk about grading, obviously we're going to hit some third rail topics, and I'm going to move a little faster just because of time, but I want to be clear about what we're not doing. I think we've already talked about not watering down our standards, and I think we just talked about that, or not reducing ac academic expectations. But we do need to acknowledge that we live in this A through F world that won't go, that's not going away anytime soon. So I think it's really important to say that when we work with grade reform, we may change the way we talk about it. We may change the scale we use, but we're fully acknowledging that, especially at that high school level, A through F isn't going away anytime soon. The notion of a grade grade point average isn't going away anytime soon. What we can do within that is ensure that everything that we put down on a transcript has meaning and ha is an accurate depiction of student learning and is good for kids in that it showed them exactly what we want out of that. So, and we also, as we kind of just talked about, we also need to acknowledge the role of grading grades in students' lives in the future. We need to acknowledge that this is a fearful topic for parents to talk about because of these college implications. And we need to be have that constantly reassured voice to say, this is not about lowering standards, it's about raising them. It's about making sure that every kid gets there. So you asked what we're changing right now and, and how are we doing this? Our PD day revolved around these two things. And this is what we're asking for when we say, what do we want to see change soon and almost immediately? Right now, we started with mindset. When we talked about Rick Wormley coming in in, 20, in 2021, that was really about mindset. And our strategy has been to say, let's talk about how we think about grading. Then let's talk about what we actually do in a classroom. And that's where we were with this PD day was talking about the practices and ensuring that the practices we engage in match our beliefs, right? We all believe that kids don't learn at the same pace. We all believe that kids learn, every kid learns differently. We all believe that every kid has strengths, every kid has weaknesses, right? Our practices when it comes to grading don't match that. And we've got to match that up. And that's what we said we wanted to see was we had, we wanted to give people the chance to examine Examine your own grading policies and ask yourself, does that, does that support a student who may learn slower, right? Does it support to when we don't accept late work and we say, no, you missed it by a minute, you're out, right? Does that support that some kids just take longer to learn or need another, another shot, right? And we'll talk about that in a little bit. The second piece was really, how do we take the work that we've done with grades and assessment and grade and practical grading reform, like talking about averaging and talking about late work and retaking things? How do we merge that with deep learning? And it really came down to what John said earlier, uh, what Dr. Moy said earlier, is that learning demands feedback, that it's all about feedback. And how do we enhance the role of feedback in the class in the classroom assessment while within a deep learning environment? And we'll touch briefly on that in a moment. So. So what does this look like when we ask for this to happen? We kind of came to these four points that we want grading and grading and assessment is focused on learning over behavior. If I need a silly example of what that looked like is raise your hand if you ever got points for taking in a Kleenex box to your elementary classroom, right? That's not learning, that's compliance, that's a behavior, right? 
or when we, you know, you were quiet today, you get three points. It's that kind of thing. We want grades to be focused on learning, not on compliance. Um, collaboration, again, we said around essential standards and assessment is an expectation. We have to collaborate as staff members in order to end what, what's kind of known in the parlance of, as the educational lottery, right? It's, you know, I'm, I'm going to take it here because it's easier at that school than it is here. Or I heard that teacher is a harder grader than I am, than this teacher. So everybody wants this teacher. That's not fair to either educator. And that's not fair to kids and that's not fair to families. So it's only when we agree what successful evidence of learning looks like, when we collaborate around saying, what, what, do, what is our standard? What does evidence of success look like? Then we can show the kids that. And when you say, what are we doing in the short term? That's our next step, is to have those collaborative conversations about what does success look like? How do we bring consistency to that kind of, that discussion? Um, We've talked enough about students and staff social emotional well being. I want to touch on staff real quick because one of the true drivers of this with the teachers we were working on is that we also know that better assessment practices can lead to staff well being, right? Uh, Trustee Heard talked about grading, having that feeling of having the need to grade every last thing and how much time is stolen from teachers on Sunday nights by having to grade that when really the research shows that they're better off just discussing that learning in a classroom with a kid anyway. So this is a lot about staff emotional well-being as well when we talk about this. The last piece is probably the most important when it comes to what practical change do we want to see. Got to get to the point where students have multiple opportunities to show their learning and are not penalized for the time it takes them to learn. That's a tough one when averaging and the way we calculate things is so ingrained in our culture, but we want to untangle that over time. Um, as we said, our immediate goal, and this is straight from the PD, is to increase the use of practices which match our beliefs about student learning and to decrease and eliminate the use of that which doesn't. We can't do that by fiat, but we can do it by education and collaboration. So um, what does this look like in practice? And I'm going to give some resources that are both publicly available and to you later so we don't have to go through every last one of these. And because a lot of these are coming up in the discussion. But this is just an example of certain practices that support learning. When we give kids greater choice in how they show us their learning, right? We've all had the kid who's not a good test taker. We've all had the student who, I, I, I know it, I don't take tests. It's a high pressure environment. I could tell you, I could draw it, I could do it in a different way. We've got to figure out a way that we can do that for kids without making it too much work on, on staff. We've got to share clear examples of proficient work and we've got to be clear about learning targets. Um, we also we already discussed multiple opportunities, but when we talk about practices that don't don't support learning, it's not so much let kids do what they want, let students do whatever they want, let them turn it in. It's not about that. It's about being clear. When we just assign a grade and don't talk about learning, kids don't learn from that. They're way better off with fewer pieces of feedback than a lot of scores that don't mean much. Assigning grades or scores based only on completion. Um, when we score things that aren't directed to learning targets, we're back to Kleenex boxes and, you know, did you go to the museum on Sunday? Although that one might be kind of kind of close, but um, things like that. So we just want to work with our staff to support the practices that are that support learning and get rid of the ones that don't. So um, I know we've got to talk about scales a little bit because that comes up every time. So we're going to segue to that with this. Meaningful grades aren't a collection of points. When we say, what's the meaning of a grade? Nobody says, it's an 85. That has meaning, right? It's not an average. It's not a punishment. It's not a reward. The meaning of a grade is a description of student learning. So that when kids get scores or grades or smiley faces or N's and S's and E's, that they know what it means. That's why our elementary report card is surprisingly effective in the way it's laid out, because it says, needs improvement. Excellent. That meaning is clear and baked right into the right into the cake there. Um, but to do that, we often have to talk about grading scales. And I know anytime we do that, we get a it's it tends to be the first off ramp that we take. And it can be a real distractor to the whole discussion about learning. But it's really important to kind of talk about that how we calculate and how we measure things does can does not impact how we deliver instruction or how we work with struggling kids, 
right? Grade scales above all need to be accurate and clear of meaning. The one we're most familiar with is the 90, 80, 70, 60 grade scale and everything else is an F, right? That has no basis in science, no basis in research. It's really just an arbitrary thing that's developed over time. And it has some meaning because you know what a, you know, I know a 95 is better than a 50, but you don't know what a nine, what the difference between a 94 and a 93 is or an 83 and an 82. And when it gets arcane like that, and it's not clear to kids, it can be, it can be just as detrimental as it can be helpful. Um, that traditional grading scale has the same comfort to us as, you know, when your speedometer flips over from 99 to a hundred, it's just neat numbers that are comforting, but they don't have the kind of meaning that we tend to assign to them right? Changing a grading scale does not change instruction and it doesn't change learning and it doesn't water down standards. We get a lot of concern when we talk about, you know, if you get off that 90, 80 grading scale, it means something different. It no more, it just means we're using a different measuring stick to talk about learning, right? I could say to you that this room is 80 degrees right now. That might mean something to you. If you were just outside in the cold, that might feel really nice and warm. If you were just outside in the hot, that would feel really cold. Somebody else could walk in the room and say, it's 36.6 degrees in here. What are you talking about? No, it's 80. It's 36. You're just talking about using two different scales to measure. You haven't changed the temperature of the room. And what would be really not helpful if somebody came in and said, yeah, the average temperature in this room is 65.6 degrees over time. Doesn't tell you anything, but I digress. But it's really important. I use that as an example to talk about that changing a scale doesn't change what's happening. It changes the clarity with which we can talk about it with kids. So, 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 um, and uh, so, the big resource that came out of our uh, our work last year during the 21-22 school year, the grading reform committee, which was made of of these teachers, and it was, it was all teacher created created this grading and assessment handbook. And we'll post this on the website by the, end, by the end of this week, but it was rolled out to staff at the PD day and we wanted to give it to them first. Um, but it's got a lot of these examples about grading practices and how we look at things and how we work and how can we, how can, if I'm a teacher who wants to do this work, how can I do it a little bit better? And we'll be using this handbook as a guide for, for future sessions. Um, want to talk about the role of assessment. How do we talk about the role of assessment in a deep learning environment? Given all the stuff that Dr. Pettish talked about earlier, what does it mean? How do we grade that? Or how do we talk about learning with our kids when it's when we want them in these deep learning environments that are more about doing than about complying or about learning just content, right? And it really comes down to this. It's about feedback. It's about the more we're just talking with kids about what they're learning and saying, you did this well, you need to do more of this, the better off kids and staff are, right? So the question we asked at the PD day and the immediate change that we were looking for was how can we increase the quantity of the amount of quantity of good learner, learner feedback and decrease the role of just giving back scores? So, um, I wanted to get, give an opportunity, but I, I wanted to play this game with you first. So uh, this is a this is just a really good example of how off some of our conversations about learning can be sometimes. So which of the following, when we talk about assessment having three parts, how we assess kids, right? Do we give them tests, projects? How, how we give them feedback? How do we communicate what's been done well and what still needs to be worked on? And the scores we give them, which of those is most important to student learning? Learn to feedback, right? Nobody says anything else. But if I were to ask this question, which of the following do we stress out about and spend the most time on, right? Which is it? It's totally backwards. Nobody argues about learner feedback. They all argue about why we don't round up things sometimes, right? We just want to reverse that paradigm in a deep learning environment. We want to spend most of our time with learner feedback, less about, well, what number did you give it, right? That's where the real learning happens. That's where the deep learning happens. So um, I want to open it up for questions, but I, I feel this time pressure coming in. Um, do, you do we have questions on what we've seen so far where I just kind of describe before I get to kind of what are our next steps and where are we going in the, in the near future? We're almost there.
I have two more. Uh, I have three more slides just about how we're going to engage our parent community on this. So I could. Great. Yep. Okay. I'll do that. So I want to be clear about what we're going to see in upcoming years. One, those evolved practices. We want to continue working with our staff on at the site level to say we want practices that meet that match our beliefs. We've talked about that enough today already. Um, it's just tough because it's not a clarity we can give you with we're going to have this rule. Every kid gets to have retakes. We're not because that's not honoring our teachers work. And it's not honoring just the culture of how we how we want our teachers to to be autonomous and be and do the great work that they do. So how we do it is education and, and talking more about it and, and working with people. Um, the second piece is enhanced collaboration. That's the next stage of professional development around grading and assessment and deep learning is collaborating around grade levels and course like groups to bring that consistency around the district wide essential standards that we spent the last two that the last two years building thanks to mainly the liaisons who were able to kind of keep running that and that was no short that was no short road for them um we need to enhance we need to do better at, and we will at bringing survey into this discussion of how of what the practices look like and how we can better support teacher and staff emotional social emotional well-being um, one of the big drivers of the grading reform committee work has been that this needs to be yes we will always want this to be better for kids but but in today's environment and in a post-COVID world, we need to reduce stress on teachers too. And we, we can do that with better grading practices. Um, I'm gonna go to the last one first, but we, we're always having continuing conversations about do our report cards and our learning management systems say what we want them to say about learning? Um, we're always talking about, you know, would some other report card be better? We're gonna continue that conversation, but there's nothing explicit happening for the 23, 24 school year for sure. Um, and the learning management system, that was a big discussion with Schoology and how do we make Schoology a better communicator for, um, for learning, for grades, for assessment. It was a, one of the most amazing things that we learned when we brought on Schoology, it was a, kind of a bumpy road. And a big reason for that was that we literally have hundreds and hundreds of different grading scales in our district already in place. You know, it, that could mean standards-based, evidence-based, elementary-based grade averages, but it could also mean 93 to 100 is an A in my class, but it's a 91 to 100 is an A across the hall. Things like that, that I think with our learning management system, we can talk about what kind of consistency we can bring to that over time. Um, most importantly, we know this is, I keep saying third rail topic, but how do we engage our parents in our community? We've got to engage them along the way. Um, and to do that, I want to be, I want to just highlight some ways that parents can get involved in this conversation. The first is that we'll have two evening events on April 13th and April 27th, informational and input kind of what does, what should grading look like? How, what does better grading and assessment look like? Um, we'll continue those through fall of 20, fall of 24 this year and next year. We'll, we'll just continue having those. Um, fourth one, I'd love to have any parents that are interested in having this conversation join the grading reform committee. We want, we want more people. It's a, it's the most astounding group of educators you could hope to be around. And I know several of you have been on it at varying points throughout its uh, inception. Um, and lastly, we're going to talk about next year. Um, and kind of covered the first two, but last year, next year, we will be forming a committee to look at our policy. We said our strategy was mindset, practice, policy. Um, next year, we should be at the policy part where we can form a community committee of teachers, staff, stakeholders, uh, counselors, admin, students to look at what our policies are. The state of California does require us to have a district wide grading policy. Um, it also requires that teachers hold a great amount of autonomy over that. And we've got to kind of marry those two ideas and see what that means for us. And that's going to be a great conversation. We had one of the most forward thinking homework policies in the, I'd say in the state or the country 10 years ago. And we were really the first people to, to codify that we, that we needed to look at homework differently. We have a great homework policy. It's time to look at that and see what kind of updates it needs. And lastly, we have to talk about the grade challenge procedure and policy because right now it is conflict driven. It is a miserable process that when we disagree about learning and a grade, it becomes just a miserable process for our staff, for our parents, for our teachers. It's not fair to anybody involved. 
Um, I, I think that if we centered that process around what is it that we wanted the student to learn, whether or not we can, there's still an opportunity to do that and protecting the teacher's autonomy and the teacher's, what the teacher wanted in the first place, we can balance all those interests in a way that doesn't lead to the absolute amount of stress that this puts some of our staff members and kids and families through. So we'll be looking at that policy next year. Um, I think that's it. We had another video, but I'm gonna skip that, but I will make sure that you have it and I will post this presentation online. So thank you for the time. I'm sorry if I went a little bit over. And we're gonna make sure we're gonna blast out those those dates, the April yeah. dates. So yeah, that, I'll work on publicity okay. for all that right. tomorrow. For sure. Thanks. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak, even though we're um, kind of out of time. I appreciate you. Um, a lot of um, subject matters were covered. And so um, I've been getting emails uh, from a community viewer. So I, I'm sure you guys did too. So I just want to pick out some of the more important ones. Um, it's important to provide feedback to our students because our jurisdiction, you as educators, me as taxpayers, is to educate. So if we're not even willing to spend the time to provide feedback through assessments, um, and of course that require you know teachers to put in their time to grade papers, whether it's during their um, you know um, um, what do you call those uh, prep 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 periods or you know, during their personal time, it's their freedom. However, it is part of their job. So I don't know how we can get around it. When I was growing up, teachers uh, in my days used to grade homework in class. That's what we do first thing in our lesson. You get that out of the way, then you do instructions. And then the rest of the, the time is um, you know, for like um, individual work time. So I'm not sure what's going on these days um, that teachers are having such mental challenges just, you know, um, doing what they're supposed to do, such as grading papers. And I have actually noticed that sometimes I don't even know if the finals were properly graded and um, my students still get a grade. Um, but of course, there's no way for me to know that. So these days, how I assess my own children's learning is by how brave they are, if they are still willing to learn the subject matter, then in my household, we are competitive uh, sportsmen family. So we kind of take it as like, you know, uh, when you go to a game, you win some, you lose some. So when you get a back grade, it's like, okay, you, you lost this game, but there are other games. And so I have learned, thank God, uh, from that to have a strong stomach and know that in life also, you, you win some, you lose some. And I have learned to just shut down the grades and just focus on bravery like of my children how how much how brave are they still willing to try and when I talk to them are they able to carry you know a cognitively competent conversation with me so that's all I have the time to share with you thank you Mike's off Mr. Arada please brought a second sign had I known how this was going to work today so I'll be talking about this. I'm glad to show it to you in more detail uh, later, but I do want folks at home to be able to see it too. So uh, just very quickly introduction. These two came to me by way of parent uh, concerns. And so those are some grading scales that I do know about. So I'm going to mention those. After uh, critical race theory and LGBTQ activism comes the third wave of SRB USD's equity maneuvering, grading for equity. Uh, grades themselves are now described as inequitable. The district's apparent answer, as illustrated now on the sign and at srbexpositor.com, 
and no matter how much it's denied, uh, is uh, an effective dumbing down of performance expectations and related, related grading standards. Given no specifics today, after four years, Chris, um, the examples I've received and shown on the sign, uh, one online, another sent me by a concerned parent, happen to be those exhibited at the two middle schools with the largest drops in CAA SWP math testing last school year, i.e. Charlotte Wood, one hand, and Stone Valley, the other, respectively, with 14-point and 12-point drops against the district's average five-point drop. The sign shows the letter grade breakdown posted at Charlotte Wood's back to school night. Those who recall grade equivalents may remember A's corresponding to 90 or 93 to 100%. C's, once upon a time, 70% to 79% or so, now require merely a 37 to 59% performance. The M, P, E, and N letter designations were initiated at Stone Valley by teacher Courtney Konopaki there. The M stands for mastery, the P for proficient, E for emerging, N for no evidence of learning. Presently, combinations of those assessments lead to the A through D grade assignments. Courtney Konopaki says she no longer assigns any Ds herself. In what previous board meeting were these radical changes discussed and approved? And I see no updates to Mr. George's Grade Reform Committee webpage. Hard to get to that page for starters. Meanwhile, one grading and equity slide last summer explained that you got to break some eggs to make omelets and fair isn't equal. The developing equity outcome appears to be reminiscent of Alice in Wonderland's Dodo. Everybody has won and all must have prizes. It appears that the MPEN grading system, like the CAA SWP reports, provide only qualitative, very generalized, nearly useless assessments of knowledge and skills. For example, Sandra demonstrates some ability to solve well-posed mathematics problems by adapting her knowledge of problem-solving skills and strategies. That's what you get out of CAA SWP. More granular reporting is what's needed, or it remains useless. An example of that would be Sandra is able to solve quadra quadratic equations. Sandra understands the slope-intercept form for linear equations and can solve such or can graph such equations. It's the same problem for Engli English and language arts. There appears, to, there appears to be no reporting, like Sandra uniformly writes sentences with correct subject-noun-verb agreement. That's the kind of test results that are needed. Thank you. I wish we had another hour because I feel like there is a ton to discuss and, and actually think our public commoners kind of hired up some other things I'd like to discuss too re related to grading. Um, but I, I think if anybody has any like brief comments, let's take them, but no, given the time. Yeah, and but I do think we should take more time needed. as yeah. a board to discuss it even further. As, Can we have yeah. another workshop to go deeper on this or, or are there PD days that we can join you on? Um, Because I think there's a strong nexus in the work that you talked about with essential standards and getting feedback on those and actually the kind of things Mr. Arata talked about, right? Because they're not the, the super global example of, you know, the really generic stuff. It's these are the essential standards and this is how you're doing and you have feedback during the course and you have feedback at the end of the course. And I think that would be really valuable for everyone. And I think also that understanding the value of meaningful assessment, you know, and I keep kind of circling back to this CASP and is that really giving us the, the authentic assessment? And it's the same with grades, you know, when you have a, I hate to use the word superficial, but a superficial A or a superficial F, it's creating different different kind of barriers, right? Because the superficial A may, may, if colleges actually look at grades to some extent, may get you to a position later on in life that you're not quite ready for. You don't really have the, 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 um, the learning that because that A is a little superficial in the way that it was assessed. And then same with superficial lower grades that creates barriers. So you're not even going to put yourself in that position to be in that, to apply to that same school because your grade is telling you that you don't belong there when in fact that's not really assessing what you know. And so anyway, so, um, and then just briefly one thing that uh, we don't have to talk about it now, but from a, like a, something to think about and that I would want to ask at some point would be how um, staff is um, is engaging and receiving the this 
this shift in grading reform and the support that's being um, provided for them. And, and I, I, I appreciate the working with Servia to, to make sure that it's a collaborative transition and not just a, we're gonna tell you from on high transition, so. One more thought I wanted to add. If you go back to the beginning of the conversation about preparing our students for the world of work 15 down the, years down the road, this relates even to today's work. When you're in a job, you do not get an assignment every day and, a, and feedback every day. You maybe get feedback annually, right? And so I really wonder if this transactional system we have with our point system for 15 points for every homework assignment and 100 points for this test and all that just even sets kids up for the wrong attitude about not just learning, but work, right? Because you know, we're talking about work ethic in this. I mean, we're kind of afraid that if we don't grade often enough, they're not going to do it. I, I think if they're in the room and it's engaging, they're going to do it and it's going to stick and it's not going to be transactional. It's I went to school and I did what students do. And, and I also think just being able to answer all those really tough questions too, like just like some of the presenters asked too, like, is this really what we're doing or, or does it look different than this? Or what, how does the equity component of this look like? You know, is it, Hey, there's a minority. So we move them up a grade so that we have equal grades. Cause you know, that that question is going to come up. So it's, I think being, you know, being, being, like out in front of those objections to to say, hey, we know these questions are going to come up. Here's here's the answer to that. Uh, when when you talked about um, having assignments all the time, and I just I have two kids, and both of them were strugglers. And what I watched happen to my daughter was that once you know one or two of those assignments would get her down to a D, she just went down a rabbit hole. And she couldn't get out. And I saw that with both of them. And it was just, and it isn't, and then she would go take the ACT and get a really high score. So, you know, how does that work, right? It didn't match. So it is really important that we find a way to not, I know we can't, we're not here to take away all the stresses that our kids feel in secondary. But if we are contributing significantly to that stress with the system that we're using in order to assess them, that's what I feel that we're looking at. So as we move forward with this, um, I think that's one of the things I have my eye on because I watch my own kids struggle with these kinds of issues that weren't indicative of what they knew. And Chris, Chris and I were at a, a site visit too, we were talking about drop rates. Right. And it was like, it, it's almost like sometimes I watch my kids play a video game. If they can't get through that level, they'll just reset. And I'm like, that's almost the same concept as, as some of those drop rate things. They can't be perfect. So, yeah. We're saying that our systems sometimes make it worse, and we want to get rid of the systems that don't and build the ones that do. That's all. Okay. Thanks, everyone.